Good afternoon, I'm Abe. And I'm Frank. And today, we're adumbrating the second half of Chapter 6, The Duel for North America, in Kennedy, Cohen, and Bailey's The American Pageant Textbook. I'll start us off this time. So we start off with the section, Braddock's Blundering and its Aftermath, in which we see 60-year-old General Edward Braddock deployed to North America, leading an army of inexperienced British regulars, or redcoats, with slow, heavy artillery through the North American forest. So clearly not a very good idea from the onset. In addition, when they finally met the French troops, the French began to use uh, Indian tactics or guerrilla warfare, taking a shot, then diving behind cover to reload and taking another shot, while the British simply advanced in lockstep towards where the French were firing from. Needless to say, it was a slaughter, and the British troops were massacred in the first battle in which they encountered the French. In the aftermath of this, the frontier from Pennsylvania to North Carolina felt the Indian wrath, as scalping occurred everywhere and whole towns were burned, since there were no longer British troops capable of defending the frontier. As the British troops tried to counterattack at strategic wilderness posts and French forts, defeat after defeat piled up. So, Abe, was any leader capable of saving England? Of course. So we had William Pitt succeed Braddock after he perished. And William Pitt was known as the great commoner and later the organizer of victory for all his successful changes. These changes included stopping the assaults on the French West Indies and instead concentrating on the Quebec Montreal area since that area controlled the supply routes to New France. Pitt also replaced old cautious officers with younger, daring, audacious officers. In 1758, Louisbourg fell. This was the first of Pitt's victories, and this route of a fort began to wither as New France's vine supplies dwindled. Pitt chose 32-year-old James Wolfe for the siege of Quebec. James Wolfe commanded an army that boldly scaled the cliffs of a wall protecting Quebec, and he met French troops near the Plains of Abraham, and he fought the French commander Marquis de Montcalm, in which the French were defeated and the city of Quebec was surrendered. So in this 1759 Battle of Quebec, it ranks as one of the most significant engagements in British and American history. And when Montreal fell in 1760, that was the last time that French flags would fly on American soil. France was totally kicked out of North America. So in the peace treaty at Paris in 1763, with France totally removed from the Americas, British got Canada and all the land to the Mississippi River. The French, however, were allowed to retain some small but valuable sugar islands in the West Indies and also two different isles in the Gulf of St. Lawrence as fishing stations. The final blow to the French came when, that, when they ceded Louisiana to Spain in order to con compensate, compensate for Spain's losses in the war. Remember, the French and the Spanish were allied. Great Britain became the leading naval power in the world and a great power in North America. So Frank, tell me how the colonial spirit began to evolve after the French and Indian War. Well, the French and Indian War was a turning point in the colonist perspective in a number of ways. First, colonists, having experienced war firsthand and come out the victors, were very confident in themselves mm -hmm. and their fighting capacity. Second, the myth of British invincibility had been shattered. Remember what we saw a couple sections ago with Braddock, how he marched his troops towards Indian tactics and simply got slaughtered in the ensuing battle. And third, and perhaps most ominously, friction developed between British officers and the colonial troops, because the British refused to recognize any American officer above the rank of captain. However, hardworking Americans believed that they were the equals of the Redcoats, and resentment began to grow between the British and the colonials. The Brits were concerned about the American secret trade with enemy traders during the war. And in fact, in the last year of the war, they even banned the colonies from exporting any goods in the worry that it would go to an enemy port. During the French and Indian War, the Albany Congress had shown them that Americans from different parts from the, uh, from the colonies had found that, surprisingly enough, they had a lot in common. They had similar traditions, similar language, similar religion and ideals and the barriers of disunity between the colonies began to melt. But tell me, Abe, what was the aftermath of the French and Indian War in terms of political effects? 
Okay, so now that the French had been beaten, the colonists were free to roam in the Americas and were less dependent on Great Britain. Spain was eliminated from Florida and the French from Canada as a result of the Treaty of Paris, and the, therefore the Indians could no longer play the European powers against each other, uh, since it was only Great Britain that was now in control. Mm -hmm. In 1763, the Ottawa Chief Pontiac led a few French allied tribes in a rebellion through the Ohio Valley, but the British quickly retaliated and crushed the rebellion. One British commander even ordered blankets infected with smallpox to be distributed among the Indians, and the violence convinced the whites, or the British, to station troops along the frontier for the future. Now that the land, now the land-hungry Americans were free to settle past west of the Appalachians, and uh, but however, in 1763, Parliament came with its proclamation of 1763, of course, and prohibited any settlement past the Appalachians. This document was not meant to anger the colonists. It was meant to work out the Indian problem by drawing out in, at this out of bounds line. They didn't want; they wanted to prevent further conflict with the Indians. But the colonists saw it as a form of oppression from a faraway country, and the Americans defied the treaty. An estimated of 1,000 wagons rolled through the town of Salisbury and went west in defiance of the proclamation. The British were proud and haughty and were in no way too ready to accept this blatant disobedience of their Americans, and the stage was therefore set for the Revolutionary War. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe, and we'll catch you guys next time in the Road to Revolution.